For as long as we can remember, there's always been sci-fi on TV. Whether it be the iconic Star Trek franchise in all its various iterations, the numerous incarnations of Doctor Who, or the impressive catalogues of both Jerry Anderson and Erwin Allen, sci-fi on the tube has entertained billions of people over the decades and continues to be just as prevalent now as it has ever been. To the point where a newly released series today can rival its big screen counterpart in quality, budget and scope. Yet when looking through the nostalgic lens of the past, it would be easy to believe science fiction on TV has been around forever. But in fact, there was a time when it didn't exist. Unlike the well-documented history of the first ever science fiction film, A Trip to the Moon, released in 1902, sadly, most sci-fi fans aren't actually aware of how the genre started on the small screen, which is a story that is both fascinating and tragic at the same time. As hard as it is to believe, the device we know as television has been around since the 1920s whilst its adoption by consumers didn't occur until the 1930s and even then only in small quantities. Yet its popularity, affordability and accessibility changed dramatically during the post-World War II recovery boom. As a result, the box not only found its way into millions of American homes, but it was at the forefront of what was to become known as the Golden Age of Television. Naturally, a TV by itself is a pretty useless device unless something is showing on it. As a consequence, both new and existing radio studios, who had since adopted TV programming as part of their repertoire, quickly created a vast array of new content to fill the airwaves. When it came to the genre known as science fiction, a decent number of films from various countries had been produced in sporadic bursts since 1902, yet science fiction as a whole was still considered an eclectic interest and not looked upon with any sense of mainstream importance. As a result, by the late 1940s, thanks to the massively successful science fiction magazines, which had been around since the 1920s, along with science fiction radio shows and the movie industry, it was only natural the genre would find its way into American homes via television. As fortune would have it, science fiction on TV wasn't an entirely new concept. In England, for example, the 1920s science fiction theatrical play R.U.R. had already been broadcast on TV twice, once as a 35-minute extract in 1938 and again as a 90-minute live production in 1948. In addition, a live teleplay of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine was broadcast in the UK in January 1949. However, a far more significant milestone occurred on June 27, 1949, when the all-new Captain Video and his Video Rangers, produced by the Dumont Television Network, became the very first science fiction show specifically written and produced for television to go to air. And while you're doing that, do you mind if I contact Orbit Control? Oh, you did not ask, Captain. My laboratory and everything in it is completely yours. All right. Well, Ranger, we're going to have to make this a short trip to Tyson, because I also want to stop off at the planet Mars. I want to st study the structure of that planet. And teach C to the old one, too, huh? <laughs> Maybe we can. As noted by TV historians, Dumont were notorious for producing low-budget content quickly so as to meet demand. And this was certainly the case with Captain Video, whose adventures mostly took place in his headquarters purely for budgetary reasons. As for the production itself, in what would be considered totally unheard of today, the series was broadcast live six days a week in 15 to 24 minute segments. I don't like this business about confiscating the weapons. For years, Mars has had a very profitable trade agreement with the uh, war materials with Tercet. I withdraw the statement. Despite being poorly produced, having very disjointed and mediocre scripts, as well as containing unexplained references to Western movies, which were designed to pad out the running time, 
the series was a massive hit because it knew how to cater for its target audience. Children, who to this point had never seen sci-fi on TV before, so naturally they lapped it up. Captain Video will undoubtedly arrive in an orbit control rocket. Yeah. Needless to say, it didn't take long for competing networks to realize science fiction was a genre they needed to exploit. As a result, 1950 saw a plethora of new products get released, including Tom Corbett's Space Cadet, which not only had the distinction of appearing on all four of the main TV networks, CBS, ABC, NBC and DuMont, but was inspired by the Robert A. Heinlein novel, Space Cadet, which actually involved the show purchasing the rights to use the name. But have you forgotten that our course to meet the asteroid was based on space speed? By increasing our speed, you've changed our trajectory. We'll never reach the asteroid within a thousand miles. To say nothing of the fact that we can't maneuver even if we do intercept our target. Alongside Tom Corbett was ABC's production of Space Patrol. Unlike its contemporaries, this series was outfitted with a sizable budget which allowed for bigger sets and impressive special effects. Moreover, despite the target audience being children, the series creators were consciously aware adults were also watching too. As a result, Space Patrol featured a distinctly handsome leading man along with attractive women in supporting roles. Nobody but the two of us. Who are you? How did you get in here? What do you want? You're not a space patrol. Another unique and somewhat unorthodox feature of Space Patrol was its broadcast schedule being in two time formats. The 15 minute version, which was a format carried over from radio plays, was produced during the weekday whilst the longer 30-minute version occurred on the Saturday, all of which were broadcast live. After two years, and while still appearing on TV, both Space Patrol and Tom Corbett were produced as radio shows utilising their respective TV casts for each. Alongside Captain Video, Tom Corbett and Space Patrol was yet another children's adventure show, Buck Rogers. Unlike its compatriots, Buck Rogers at least had a long and successful history both in comic book and movie serial form. Unfortunately, this success didn't translate well to the TV medium, and as a result, the 30-minute show only lasted 36 episodes. Wait a minute! Yes, dear. Now cut out all this play acting and tell me what's going on here. Abner Thorne, the inventor, has died and left a secret formula to the manufacture of platinum in his safe at Thorne Manor. What's more, his will containing the combination to the safe is to be read tonight. So? So it's absolutely essential to the economy of the world that that secret formula be registered immediately with the Science Council. Likely reasons for the show's failure have been attributed to the small budget used to produce it, which much like Captain Video, saw Buck constantly stationed in a secret laboratory to keep the show's costs down, whilst behind the scenes, the regular cast changes certainly would not have helped. As it is, Buck himself was portrayed by three different actors whilst Wilma Deering experienced two actress changes. As a result of all this new material being created, in 1950 alone, there were four different science fiction adventure series aimed at children being broadcast at the same time. By the early 1950s, Captain Video, the series which had launched science fiction on TV, found it was under serious threat from its competitors. Consequently, it was forced to up its game in the form of using scripts written by highly distinguished science fiction authors in an attempt to boost the intellectual and imaginative level of the stories. I guess there just ain't nothing else we can do. Well, there may be, but sacrificing the ranger's life isn't one of them. Hello, Everett. Hello, Everett. Yes, Captain. Look, Everett, I'd just like to warn you. If you do not keep your word, if you should happen to harm the ranger, and believe me, I'll never rest until I've made you pay for it a thousand times over. With the science fiction genre now firmly entrenched on American TV screens, 
1953 saw the premiere of a number of new shows in addition to those already in production. First was The Secret Files of Captain Video, a spin-off from the parent series which only aired on Saturdays. Following on from the unsuccessful Buck Rogers was another American icon, Flash Gordon. Yet unlike the original comic series, which saw Flash, Dale and Zarkov visiting Mongo, this time they were part of the Galactic Bureau of Investigation, travelling the galaxy in their ship, the Skyflash. What do you make of it, Dale? Recognize any of the metals in that alloy? It has a tractor seal base, but there are about seven other elements which I can't identify. Tractor seal? That's a metal that's found on Saturn, isn't it? Yes. It's in small quantities on Pluto and Uranus. That narrows its origin down to three possible planets. Despite being well received by audiences, ultimately it suffered the same fate as its compatriot, in only having a short run before cancellation. However, Unlike both Buck and Flash, who didn't adapt well to the small screen, Superman, who was yet another iconic comic figure from the 30s, had a much better time of it. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. With the adventures of Superman experiencing a very successful TV run from 1952 to 1958, mainly because it catered for a broader market. Yet not all TV shows are being created and broadcast nationally, with some being produced by local studios for viewing in selected cities. One of these was Captain Zero, which was inspired by both Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon. Rather interestingly, the series featured a time machine which allowed the titular character to visit different eras in the past to correct issues with history. Now look. You don't seem to realize the dangers of travel in outer space. Our rocket ships are still far from perfect, and any number of things could go wrong. Besides, as yet, we don't know exactly what we may run into out there. Despite having been originally created in 1952, the nationally released Rocky Jones Space Ranger didn't commence regular production until 1953, with its premiere occurring in 1954. Please, Mr. Secretary, assign me as navigator. Do you know exactly what Rocky's mission is? Yes, sir. Carrying the space ambassadors to the Interplanet Peace Conference. Vina, this mission involves the greatest responsibility. I realize that, sir. The passengers are the top diplomats and scientists in our solar system. Unlike many of its forerunners, Rocky Jones was a pre-recorded series which not only allowed it to feature a high degree of production quality, but also allowed the episodes to be re-edited and released as TV films. Unfortunately, due to the likely high cost of producing the series, mainly the special effects, it only lasted one season. With a title sounding eerily similar to Rocky Jones was the weekly series Rob Brown of the Rocket Rangers starring famous actor Cliff Robertson. Directly inspired by Tom Corbett, the series hired the same director and writers from that series, which actually resulted in a legal lawsuit being issued between the production networks due to the similarities of the two shows. By the mid-1950s, American TV was brimming with copious amounts of adventure series, including those of Johnny Jupiter, Operation Neptune, Captain Midnight, which was later renamed to Jet Jackson, as well as Commando Cody, which was initially made for television before appearing in cinemas as a weekly serial. But then out of the blue, something totally unexpected happened. In what has started with a blaze of excitement and unparalleled success, by 1955, every one of these wonderful science fiction adventure series with the exception of Superman and Captain Midnight, all of whom had entertained millions of children on television for six years, just stopped. Although there's no definitive explanation as to why all these shows halted production in the same year, 
There are those who believe an oversaturation of the market was to blame, with too many shows being broadcast all at once, especially as live shows didn't have predefined seasons as we know them now. Instead, they were on TV virtually all year round. As a consequence, the gradual increase in serious science fiction films in the cinemas led TV studios to reconsider their target market from children to adults. As a precursor of what was to come, even as Captain Video, Tom Corbett, Space Patrol and others continued to entertain scores of young viewers on a daily basis, Alongside them were two anthology-based series specifically aimed at capturing the adult market, Tales of Tomorrow and Out There. Despite their production runs being relatively short, the most significant aspect of these series was that their self-contained stories were written by both notable and up-and-coming authors. As a result, they soon proved the future of science fiction on TV was the anthology format. Thou art more fair. Stop it, let me buy it. I wouldn't hurt you. You've turned your face from me. And when you spoke of me, it was in anger and fear. But I felt only love. Felt love? In what could almost be considered a literal changing of the guard, just as all the children adventure series were wrapping up in 1955, a new anthology series called Science Fiction Theatre commenced the start of its three-year run. However, unlike Tales of Tomorrow or Out There, Science Fiction Theatre was more attuned to actual science rather than fiction, and as a result the series often focused on the work of real scientists, inventors and technological innovations which had a profound impact on the audience who were bedazzled by all these fantastic developments. I call it my uh, benevolent bomb. I've combined green chloroplasm, the stuff which is the very essence of our plant life, with plutonium to explode over the desert. A fallout of ash consisting entirely of radioactive chloroplasm would mingle with the desert sands and with a oh, minimum of irrigation. Make the arid land fertile, don't you see? It would give us something to point to, to say, look, we use this great force for creation by creating an age of plenty. With this in mind, similar-based science fact shows also started to appear in the form of The Man and the Challenge and Men into Space. Finally, in 1959, TV science fiction celebrated its illustrious 10th birthday. Yet so much had changed within this 10-year period, it was as if the genre had grown from birth to adulthood. In addition, this year saw the release of a new series called The World of Giants, which would effectively be retooled and rebranded years later as Land of the Giants by Irwin Allen. But perhaps of greater significance was that the television medium was now a prime fixture in American homes, and as a result, the quality of content had improved immeasurably. But this newfound success had come at a cost, as all the groundbreaking science fiction TV material created in the early years was not only consigned to just being a footnote in history, but also complete obscurity, as many of these programmes are now presumed to be lost. Yet in what could be considered a bizarre twist in both irony and serendipity, Ten years after the poorly produced, low-budget, yet groundbreaking premiere of Captain Video and his Video Rangers, 1959 saw the release of two brand new science fiction anthology series. One of whom was One Step Beyond, which lasted for three years, whilst the other was a new series which would not only bring TV science fiction into the mainstream, but would be revered for generations to come. Yes, this was the Twilight Zone. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs>